you know, you don't want to talk positively about yourself unless you're some self-help guru. But I think, you know, I, I, you know, I, I study like people my age, right? There's a lot of, a lot of guys that I grew up with and toured with and not musicians, but like crew guys and people I just known my whole adult life are just miserable and lost and kind of suicidal and depressed. And, and I'm not, you know, I, I have my moments, but for the most part, the, I think what differentiates people as they age is curiosity. I'm curious. I'm, I'm curious about things. I want to know about things. And I notice that a lot of my friends that I went to high school with or a lot of people I've known my whole life, they're just not curious about anything. I think curiosity is key to having a lot of opportunities happen in your life and, and, and having, being excited about things. Like on the one hand, you could say, oh, the bicycle thief coming out on vinyl, who gives a fuck? And print up 1,500 of them, who cares? That's what 90% of the people my age that are musicians would think. It's not what I fucking think. I think it's fucking amazing. It's great. It's so fun. I want people to hear this record again. I want to hear it again. I hadn't, here's, we recorded a song right in the middle of that, that Bicycle Thief album. Because, you know, it was obvious there wasn't a hit on the Bicycle Thief album, <laughs> right? And that was in the era of the, you know, the mid-90s, late-90s, where modern rock radio was so huge and so powerful. And it made Pearl Jam and the Red Hot Chili Peppers and all the bands become these mega bands, really the future Sticks and Led Zeppelins of the world. And so... You know, it was obvious that the Bicycle Thief record didn't have a song like that. So we went into this mode where we were trying to do covers. Like maybe if we did a cover song, that could maybe get played on K-Rock or something. And we did that Oh Lonesome Me, which is a Lefty Frizzell song. But then it was on, then Ma Neil Young did it. And like we recorded that one night, I think. Like just one night. And it didn't work. And it obviously wasn't something that, was going to be played on the radio. So I had forgotten about it. I forgot we even recorded that song. And then through this process with Chris and, and immediate family and, and putting the record out, I heard that song. And now my daughter who wasn't even born is in a video of that song. <laughs> I love shit like that. I love it. At the point that you're working on the bicycle thief, were you still focused on this idea of, having a hit, having some mainstream breakthrough? Yeah, well, it's, it's that generation I come from, right? So I was the one band of the 80s that didn't have it. Like, you're talking about, like, my best friends are Anthony and Flea, Perry, Perry Farrell, um, Dave Perner from Soul Asylum, Paul Westberg, and they all had that one song, you know, some of them had 10 songs that were played on the radio, but immediately... 87, 88, 89, 90, all these songs, these hit songs. And then later, uh, and, at, and simultaneously to that, like fans of our band had hit songs. Like Beck, like Beck Hansen was like a, a Thelonious Monster fan. He was like a kid in the crowd. Like I knew his mom and, and then he has a hit song. And then, and then Gwen Stefani, this little girl that used to come see Thelonious Monster all the time, she's got a hit song and a hit album. And so hits, I know, I know that hipsters and, and uh, whatever it's called, uh, pitchfork people don't like to talk like that. I don't give a fuck what 30-year-old people think of me. But it was an era of, yeah, you want to have a song played on the radio so that you can have success and pay your rent and, and maybe, you know, have a life. And I come from a generation of musicians, and unless you get a song played on the radio, you're not going to have a life. L luckily, things have changed with the internet kind of flattened and, and made everything. I'm, I mean, I heard of Billie Eilish probably four years ago, three, year, four, three and a half years ago. My son, who's 10, who he was seven then, who's an internet whiz, he could probably run a tech company. Um, He's like, Dad, I think you would really like that. And he played me the Ocean Eyes song. Like, no one had heard it. She, she had like, you know, 20,000 views or something. And it was amazing. And all of a sudden, and she goes from that, from recording songs with her brother in the bedroom and posting them on YouTube or Bandcamp to the biggest artist in the world. 
in 12 months. That's pretty fucking incredible. That used to never happen. The only way that could happen is if you got a song played on the radio. Were you prone to jealousy in those early days? It must be difficult to see the people around you have these massive successes when you're kind of banging your head against that wall. You know, I've gone through it. You know, the older you get, the more you can re, 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 remember history, right? You can, you know. You... Rose-colored glasses. I remember thinking like a lot of different thoughts about it. I, so when Ben caught stealing, like uh, I think Dave played, but Navarro played me some of their album, their new album. And I heard the opening song, Three Days, right? And I was like, wow, this is mind blowing. But it's obviously, it's like an 18 minute song that's about fucking. It's not gonna be played on the radio. <laughs> so I was kinda, okay. Because you got to understand, Jane's Addiction's first album didn't do well at all. That that kind of gets rewritten in history too. It was very disappointing. They got they had a lot of expectation on them. They made nothing shocking, and it kind of fizzled. And so then they're making their second record, and and the first song is like twelve minute long song about fucking. It's just like oh my god, okay, so. They're not, they're not going to become bigger than us. <laughs> they, they were not at, at that point, it sounds like, maybe going out of their way to have a radio hit. <laughs> no, but then on the same cassette, that Ben Cut Stealing was on there. And I was like, that's a cool song. And Dave said, yeah, I don't even know if it's going to be on the record. And then it was on the record. And then I went to the video shoot. I was at that supermarket when they shot the video. And I remember being there thinking, Jane's Addiction is going to fucking blow up. Holy shit. And then you have these peripheral friends of mine, like Guns N' Roses, like they exploded into the stratosphere. And, and it was that era where you get played on the radio, you become successful. And so it's kind of hard to get that out of my DNA. It's out, it's out now, but back when we were making the Bicycle Thief record, it was still fully entrenched in me that you have to write a song that gets played on the radio. Because I've certainly been in positions where I've had, you know, people, and, and this is one of the good and the bad things of surrounding yourself with uh, really talented and creative people is is you will see people go on to have massive success. And, it, and it's hard not to be, it's hard not to be a little bit resentful of them when it happens. Yeah, it was, well, with the Chili Peppers, they had worked hard. It, it, the other thing you got to understand, a lot of these people worked really hard to get where they were. It wasn't like now where you just, or what came later in the, in the, in the you know, late 90s, mid, mid to late 90s, where you could be, you know, a band, have a like candle box, have one song and sell four million records. It was, that, that world doesn't exist anymore either. So maybe Nickelback, I don't know. But, but um but the Chili Peppers had worked so hard and they were everybody's favorite people, right? They certainly are mine still to this day. Anthony and Fleer, just, they're just amazing, fun, interesting, creative, challenging people. And so when they had success, I was happy for it. But, but it was success based on the Stevie Wonder song, you know what I mean? So they had they had a hit song with a Stevie Wonder cover, right? So I was happy for them, and they had worked so hard, and they had made that was their fourth album. People don't remember, you know. Nowadays, if you had three unsuccessful albums like the Chili Peppers did, you wouldn't be a band anymore. You know what I mean? The, the, e EMI really stood by them and let them make record after record and uh, and develop because of their live perform, you know, their live show. Even though the records, I see, I think they might not even have sold as well as the predecessor record. They still drew more and more people to their shows. That, that was, and so when they had success with Mother's Milk, I was happy for them. And I was happy for Dave, you know, Navarro. I loved him like a brother. And, and you know, it wasn't that, wasn't that jealousy oriented until I couldn't do it three year period of time from 88 to like 91 where I made two albums. I was worked on a solo album for years and it all wasn't very successful at all. That's when the jealousy started. <laughs> Cause I thought, Oh, it's happening to them. It's, it's going to happen to me. Then Thony's monster was on tour um, with soul asylum when runaway train took off in 91. And I was like, Holy shit. Even Dave Perner's got a hit song. Holy cow. <laughs> you know what I mean?
And so it, it did start to wear away at me eventually with my failure to have it. It was like a two pronged thing. Like I was happy in the beginning that Jane's Addiction and Chili Peppers were having success because that meant I was going to have success and Fishbone was going to have success and, and, you know, and Circle Jerks and uh, all the bands, Fugazi, everybody was going to have success because we're all a family of bands, right? The Meat Puppets had success because Kurt did their songs and then they had success. And so I thought success was going to come my way. And when it didn't, it was, yeah, it made me into kind of a bitter, drug addict, angry, frustrated person, unpleasant to be around, I would say. And The Bicycle Thief reflects some of that. The Bicycle Thief has some of who I was coming out of being into what I was learning and how to move forward in life. That's what the Bicycle Thief album is about. How to come out of darkness and go towards the light. You feel like your problems with addiction were a, a direct result of some of that frustration? I mean, at a certain point, it does become kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy or at least, you know, like a vicious cycle. It certainly, it, it speeds it up for, for sure, right? So, so... I would say when we were all drug addicts together, let's say, it was very celebratory. Though we had problems and you couldn't get up in the morning, you probably couldn't have a regular job. It still was almost positive. I hate to say that about heroin and cocaine use, but it was. It was almost, we had a community, like a tribe of people in LA that we were all making music. We were all kind of friends with each other. We were all really interesting friendship combinations. One of my good friends was Robin from the band Rat. Yeah, you know, that's the band Round and Round. Well, he was one of my best buddies. And so you had this community of, of, of pushing the envelope or exploring or living a wild life or living an excessive life and, or trying to live like what you thought your heroes live, lived like and kind of, it was an exciting time. But then it turns dark and depression and suicide and, and kind of uglier, the uglier part. Now, most people would say, and I'm an addictionologist, so it's, I can analyze myself and know what the, the standard theory is, that, that it will always progress like that. I, I, I know thousands of cases that it didn't progress like that. I think it's my identity and my sense of my sense of self was so based on success in music that it was unhealthy. And when I failed to have whatever I thought success I was supposed to have, it, it accelerated my drug use. I didn't care whether I lived or died every day from probably 93 to 96 when I got sober. I didn't, I, sometimes I would wake up in the morning just like, oh, I wish I would have died last night in my sleep. And so that's not normal addiction. That, that's a combination of depression, suicidality, and suicide, suicidal thoughts, and just bleakness and hopelessness. And I, I, don't think, I don't think that always has to be baked into addiction. I think it was my case and some, some of my friends' cases, but not all cases. I have to assume that you know, if you do fall into a state of apathy or, or nihilism, that that's, that must make the recovery process <laughs> that much more difficult because what's the point, really? What's the point of recovering if you don't care if you live or die or you don't care what right. happens? That, that's what's happening with millennials, by the way. Millennials have a hard time caring about things. They care about abstract existential things like racism. Like, how are you going to stop racism? It's not a bad concern to have. It's good to care about these things. Yeah. I'm not saying it's not, but thinking you're going to wipe it out. You can't wipe out somebody's heart. You can't wipe out somebody's thoughts. So, so I think, you know, I have a lot of millennial clients, a lot of millennial employees, and, I, I, and I'm married to a millennial. So it's just like I'm, I have a millennial son. So you, you he, feel... Do you feel that that uh, idealism um, contributes to apathy and therefore makes it more difficult to recover? The other side of these idealistic uh, longings is when it falls short, it's, it's zero. It's not like there's no sum gain in it. Like, I just think we've come a long ways just in a short period of time in 18 months about race in America. 
Because I don't look to what kids in the protests think. I look at the polling of what suburban soccer moms think. I know that you've studied recovery and a lot of these programs very extensively. Obviously, you've, you've been a part of them uh, for a number of years now. Did you experience similar frustration with those early on? Did they feel broken when you entered the system? Yeah, the recovery system is broken. It's been based on a 19, almost like a almost like a 19th century idea that you're kind of morally lost, spiritually lost. And, and as soon as you find God, you'll turn everything around. I mean, that's what AA is. And that's what most 12 step programs in America are. A higher power. Yeah. Higher power and all that. And, and, uh, and that, and there's been like what's called biopsychosocial approach to addiction, but it always and that is the Hazelden Betty Ford. It's called the Minnesota model. It's always integrated the twelve-step program in it, though it's kind of conf it kind of conflicts. But AA was the place where people got sober, so you weren't going to throw the one thing that kind of worked for decades out because you had found something new. I can just tell you that it doesn't work for young people all that well. I mean, it didn't. It worked for me, but it, it eventually. It was still a hard pill to swallow. I mean, I don't believe in God. I never have. I, I'm one of those people. I just don't have that God thing. It's going to be interesting, like 100 years from now, 200 years from now, they're going to just realize, oh, there's this genome pattern that, that religious people have that other people don't have. And, it, you know, my mother was from Sweden and like Swedish are notorious agnostics at best. And so she was agnostic, and I grew up agnostic. Here's an interesting thing. I grew up agnostic in an agnostic household going to Catholic school. And I asked my mom, why am I going to Catholic school? And she goes, it's a better education than public school. This is in the 60s, 60s, 70s. And what was interesting, Catholic school in the 1960s in Los Angeles was integrated. How, 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 how forward thinking is that? The public schools were segregated. I mean, that, that's when busing came in and then the Fishbone guys are like about eight, ten years younger than me. And they were all bussed in the busing things of the mid, late 70s, mid 70s. So I went to a, a Catholic school that that was integrated, had all races and all economic backgrounds. And it was amazing kind of way to grow up in this kind of fractured society to have this kind of idealized Catholic upbringing, but I was an atheist, and so was my mother. And I, and I asked her why I went. She said, "Because it's a better education than the public schools." And because she was an educated woman, she was born in 1918, and she graduated from college. That didn't happen a lot, right? So, in you know, in that, in that era, and she owned her own business when my dad met her. She had her own business. So, so anyways, I grew up in this weird kind of atheist thing. So then I come, I, you know, I kind of always been an atheist. Like when you're, when you're, when you just don't believe in supernatural, I didn't even really have a prejudice towards religious people. I just didn't, I didn't see why they believe what they believe. There was no evidence for believing what they believed. And it's still a touchy area because over the years, people have become more fanatical and absolute about their belief. Right. And so at first, I would say, you used to be able to say in the 19, early 1980s, yeah, no, I, you know, I'm not religious. And people were like, cool, cool. I am religious. You're not religious. That's cool. And by, by the late 90s, it was like, well, you're, what do you believe in? I, I believe in nothing. Bring the meaning is what my mom used to always say. You know, if, if somebody questioned, like, what is the meaning of life? You bring the meaning. If it's to have a family and, and, and you know, live in a rural and kind of community and have a small simple life that's what life is about if it's to become a big business tycoon and move to the city if it's to become a movie star then that's what it's about you bring the meaning but what's happened over time is people are so ignorant they don't they don't even have any kind of thoughts about what meaning is so then they get this evangelical kind of interpretation of christianity where christ is your servant and he does anything you want he'll get you a cadillac and he'll he'll make abortion go away and you just have this personal relationship with him i mean that fits in perfect to an ignorant society doesn't it so how do you reconcile that when when you're going through a program that is so heavily based on spirituality a higher power or god i don't do we don't do it 
of my rehab. But you had been through that process in the past. Yeah, I personally been through it. And and all what, what did I do to get a higher power? I just said, well, there's, you know, I used a lot of crazy ideas, which is there's a collective unconscious that, that Jung and Freud, Jung talked about mostly. And that, and I, and there are these amazing things you can read and these beautiful art and music that you can hear that's that's so much bigger than me like and one of the things that was my higher power and this sounds stupid is pet sounds by the beach boys no i'm with you it is the most beautiful piece of music like there's four or five songs on there it gives me chills thinking about how beautiful it is it's it's God or whatever people think about God, that's God to me, right? So I could turn my will and my life over to Brian Wilson. It was pretty easy to do. It's not pet sounds, but there's a story of uh, Brian Wilson playing Surf's Up on piano to, I think, Leonard Bernstein, who started crying when he heard it. I mean, you know, clearly. In my room. It was in my room. It was, it was one of the most, it's like, it's like a psalm. It's like beautiful. Like Brian Wilson, yeah. It, it, he, I mean, it's just so crazy how, what a genius he is. Beyond, beyond genius. And so when they said, you got to have a power greater than yourself, I was like, well, Brian Wilson or Pet Sounds or whatever. It's not that hard, you know? That that deity was going to intervene in me, my life, how I did that was I could live listen to pet sounds i access it so when i did what's called the six and seven step right which is you pray and meditate about your character defects i went home and listened to pet sounds i didn't think about what a bad person i am and all these bad things i did that's that's those are christian ideas i went home and listened to pet sounds and then i had a list of people that i really think i had harmed and that i had to become willing to make that right as best i could and i did and I just don't see it as that needing of superstition and supernatural stuff. It's very practical. There's a level of self-reflection that has to happen there regardless, regardless of how you get there. It, it is important to realize, uh, you know, that you have, that you have harmed people in the past and, and to make those amends. Well, yeah. And the idea that you, you have to live with that you've harmed them. Right. So the example being, I have a, a son, there is no way to unharm him. I mean, I got sober when he was nine. I abandoned him for two years. I didn't even see him. I mean, there's no way. Like, that's why the Christians love to like, oh, he forgives you and everything's okay. No, I don't forgive myself. I need to always be conscious of that when I'm interacting with him to show him how much I love and care about him to to not be influenced by guilt when I'm trying to parent him. Like these are like, I try to live my life pretty intelligently and I know that's not very popular these days. <laughs> You're supposed to live it all emotional and, and self-righteous and, and dogmatic and, or just anesthetized and like a zombie. I try to think like, how can I make it right with him? Well, and I remember thinking, oh, well, if he has these difficulties, drugs and alcohol, I need to be straight with him, not be manipulated by it or feel guilty or that I caused it. I need to be straight with him. And one of my most, one of the things I'm most proud of is he's never had to be in a rehab center. He's never, he's always been pretty much, you know, he's like everybody. He's had fuck ups and, and emotional parts of his life, but he's a solid fucking guy and he's a compassionate guy. And that's all on him. He did that. He, cho he chose to take his shitty beginnings of his life and, and make the best of it instead of be a victim of, of boo-hoo, my dad was a drug addict, blah, 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 you know? And I try to help other, other addicts not do that, like blame their parents. See, the thing that I understood is, through the recovery process, was there might be good reason why I'm so fucked up and depressed, but the reasons don't really matter. I'm fucked up and depressed. That's the real problem. I'm the one suffering. Now you can go to the root of it and say, you know, if it'll make you feel better, go tell your parents that they were horrible parents. I've seen a lot of sober people try to do that, thinking it's going to give them satisfaction, just made them feel worse. 
So it's more like about, this is probably what happened. I was abused as a kid. I was neglected as a kid. It caused me to see things this way. I want to see things a more healthy way, a more true way, a more honest way, a more loving way, a more kind way, a more compassionate way. And focusing on backwards on what happened to me is not going to help me create that. Being compassionate and loving and thoughtful and, uh, and a solid and honest and just and righteous. Um, There's a Bob Dylan song called Forever Young where he's saying what he wishes for his children. That's what I wish for myself, to to stand upright and be strong and to stay forever young, to always do for others and let others do for you. It's one of the most powerful parts of that song's lyrics. Because we all think of ourselves as doing for others. We're all, you know, all these, we pat ourselves on the back for any good deed we do in America, including rescue the drowning people. And like, it's crazy. We make heroes out of people who say, who's, who, who rescue people from drowning. I, I've never, I've been living in America since, you know, since I can remember. I was born here. My first conscious thoughts are America. I still don't understand America. It's so crazy to me. That you're a hero if you if somebody's drowning in a river and you know how to swim and you jump in and you rescue them you're a hero everybody should do that everyone should do it but that doesn't that doesn't not that doesn't make no, it not a hero like, it is a heroic act it doesn't to do that mean you're a hero it means everyone else are cowards sure but That's it's America. It's, a, it's, a, it's a selfless act to do that you're putting yourself at risk to do that i don't know that it is though I don't know that it is. And I'll give you the example. You can't live with yourself letting that person drown. How about that? Sure. It's an instinctual thing. I, I just don't get like good Samaritans and all this kind of stuff. No, we're all supposed to be like that. All, when, when the opportunity arises, we should help. We are a sick society, my friend, that we make, oh, somebody help somebody. Let's have them on TV and have an award ceremony about them. That's ridiculous. Everybody should be that way, right? In a Christian society, right? So I just always felt like I'm on acid living in this country. You touched on this a little bit, you know, that substance abuse was, I mean, obviously, and it is for a lot of people, you know, coping mechanism for depression. And, uh, you know, again, obviously, it's a vicious cycle when it comes to substance abuse and, and depression. But I assume that even, you know, once you get off of the substances that you're addicted to, you continue to, to deal with you're depression depressed. in your life. Oh, worse. It gets worse gets worse. At least it did for me. What's your process of coping with it now? Well, now I kind of, I understand it more. I have, you know, decades of dealing with it, but, but when it first happened, you just have to have this faith that, that it's going to get better. That's what I'm saying that a lot of people don't have. I know America can get better. I know it can. I know that I can get better. I know that whoever's struggling can get better but you have to have faith and you have to believe and then you have to be constructive and smart about how you're going to go about it, about achieving that. On a personal level, how do you stay hopeful through the darker periods in your life? Uh, So, uh, you know, Amazon, like uh, they do deliveries more and more every day. So uh, there, there was a Amazon dump at my house, right? Because my neighborhood's really confusing. It's kind of windy roads and people, I know that the Amazon people, when they're running behind, they can't find their address. They just kind of leave it at somebody's house. So yesterday, a package got left, or day before yesterday, a package got left here that was not even this street. And my daughter and I were going out to go to the grocery store. And I said, come on, say, we're going to take this package to the house where it belongs. And so I went and found it. It's like two streets over. I went to the address. I put the package on the front door and I started to walk away and the door opened. And it was this older guy wearing a Detroit Pistons shirt. And he said, what's going on? And I said, oh, they delivered that package. We're down on Live Oak and, and your Web Canyon. They delivered that package. I thought I'd bring it up here. The guy said, really? And I said, yeah, it came down to us. And he's like, and you brought it here? And I said, yeah, yeah, I'm just going to bond. So I just thought I'd drop it by. Have a great day. And he said, people need to do this more often, don't they? Right? Now, I don't know if he, he could be a Trumper. He lives in like the rich part of town. He could be a Trumper. I didn't care whether he was a Trumper or not. He's my neighbor and a package for him got delivered wrongly to my house and I brought it to him. 
So by doing that, I believe you impact the world. Like the, I'll, I'll tell you, there was a little boy who, and on when the South African government, this is an amazing story. The, the amazing stories in the world don't get told. All the hate stories get told. Um, he's a little boy and his, his parents died of AIDS in Africa and in South Africa. And South African government, if you remember, wouldn't allow antivirals into the country because it was some moral sin getting AIDS or something. And he was like eight years old and he had HIV, right? And at World AIDS Day, the World AIDS campaign, the AIDS project of the world had their conference or convention in South Africa to embarrass the South African government. He spoke and you can watch it on YouTube. And he said, my advice to everyone is to do what you can where you are with what you've got. That's my, that's, I, I live by that little boy's mod, motto. I do what I can where I am with what I've got. I don't, I can't control what people in Alabama believe in. I can't control what my own wife believes. Like, 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 you know, you just try to do what you can be loving, be helpful. Doesn't mean I hold back on what I believe, but I try to be respectful. Right. And that, and getting to that millennials thing, I think this idealism leads to this feudalism that you're actually acknowledging in this question. How do you stay hopeful with all this pessimism that you've pointed out? Because it's the human spirit. Do you feel that there was a point in your life when you were going through all of that, that you were kind of taking the opportunity that you had to make music for granted? Oh yeah, for sure. I've taken every opportunity for granted until I had no opportunities. And then it makes you so grateful and remorseful or regretful for all that you've squandered. And mine was, so, so getting back to our original conversation about Perry and Anthony and Flea and Dave Perner and Soul Asylum and whatever, even though I wasn't successful like them, I never worked a day of a job. I, I had money, I had a place to live, I got to go on tour, I went all over the world, I got to play music for people who, who liked my music i got to have fun i got to meet people i got to expose to so many ideas and interesting characters and so much blessings came from being able to play music but i didn't look at it as a blessing because i wasn't as successful as the chili peppers right you can but it doesn't matter you can now look at it as a blessing and i had what's called closure or some sort of acceptance thing about it and it was simultaneous to once i got sober and i was doing all right and the bicycle thief had a lot to do with it i met a lot of people on the bicycle thief tours that loved felonious monster and they would tell me how much it meant to them how much felonious monster meant to them and then how much this bicycle thief record meant to them and i was just like I got it straight like that, that really music is about touching people. It's not about how many people you touch. If you touch and, and affect people in such a way that it, that it creates a whole new way of viewing themselves and the world around them, I'll take that over a K-Rock hit for six months. Because I know that my music has had a profound effect on people because they've told me. They've, people have told me in the last 20 years that this Bicycle Thief record helped them get through the hardest times in their lives, that they listened to it over and over again. Ra, the bass player of Suicidal Tendencies, told me that. It's his favorite album. Like, how flattering is that? How beautiful is that? How great is that? It's more meaningful than selling, you know, 100,000 of them. That it helps people get through difficult times, especially with drugs and alcohol, is what most people talk about. I, I just love that. If you have this uh, newfound appreciation and, and you are no longer taking it for granted, why, why a 16 year gap between records? Well, I mean, I, I'm a drug counselor by nature, right? And music, I tell you what, in 2000, we played the, you know, I, I bought, one of the things is if you're going to be a, an, an artist you have all these kind of um kind of bucket lists that you want to do right you want to play japan you want to i did that you want to play um pink pop or you want to play at the forum or you want to you know you, you want to do these things you, like and i had done pretty much everything and i wasn't getting to a place where i could make a really safe living to have a family with in 1999 2000 the, when they everybody thought the clocks were going to explode the computers remember that 
we played, yeah, Y2K. We played New Year's Eve at the Forum with the Chili Peppers. And I remember sitting in the dressing room thinking, this is it. This is about as good as it gets. I'm playing opening for my best friends at the coolest concert hall in the world that I came to as a kid and saw, you know, Aerosmith and, and, and the Rolling Stones. And I watched the Lakers win a championship in this building. Like, it doesn't get much better than this. And that was the last show that Josh Klinghoffer played because he was going to move on. And I was just like, you know, I think my music career is over. It's, start, it's time to move on to something else. And, and honestly, I had a lot of friends that were, you know, touring around in bands with three people they didn't know, just playing songs they wrote 20 years before, which that didn't seem that appealing to me. What was that feeling? W- w- was it a feeling of closure? Was it a positive feeling? It was a positive. It was definitely a, it was definitely a positive feeling because I'm super proud. There's two things I'm super proud of. Thelonious Monsters, Stormy Weather, and the Bicycle Thief record. I, I, I had made two great records in my life. Not many songwriters can say that. Like most people make one good record and then little splashes of good. I made two really excellent records in my opinion. And that's really the only opinion that matters to me. Like I'll stack those two records up against anybody and tell me song for song, those are, those, those are pretty strong records compared to anyone. Anyone we've talked about, anyone you want to mention. Why make a bunch of shitty records? So in 2004, when Thelonious Monster made a record, um, it was just strictly because I love Pete, the drummer, and he wanted to make a record. I didn't really want to. And it was fun, but it was, you know, troublesome because by then I had started to really become a full-time responsible drug counselor. I ran a hospital program. I couldn't really stop and go say, oh, my band's playing tomorrow night. And Pete wanted to go on tour, and I didn't want to go on tour. So that was... That left things really bad. We played Coachella, we played the Silver Lake Street scene here in LA, and we played one one month of shows at at the at the uh, whatever it's called in Silver Lake. And so we played that album, and we we had some fun. But I wasn't going to take it seriously, and Pete was frustrated with me. So that led to a uh, he and I are the co kind of runners of the band. So that led to Thelonious Monsters just dead. And then Josh joined the Chili Peppers, so he's my only other musical partner. I'm not going to really be doing anything with him. So it kind of just left this 16-year gap. And then all of a sudden, this year, you know, things changed. <laughs> I, can, I can tell you when they changed, December 2020-something. 20, 20 you know, I got, I got a text on my phone that the Chili Peppers, that Josh is out of the Chili Peppers. And I, I, was, at, I was at Disney on Ice at the, at the Staples Center. And I was like, I called Flea and he answered the phone. And I said, did you, did you just fire Josh? And he said, yeah. And, and I was just like, oh my God, you're unbelievable. And so then I called Josh and talked to him. And, and that led to, you know, so many interesting things starting to happen. Josh is the one who funded the Thelonious Monster record because he, uh, you know, he said, you know, if you guys are going to do it, I'll pay for it. And so... You know, a lot of a lot of a lot of great things have happened this year. I'm sorry that it's the worst year for everybody else. <laughs> 